Um, I am a reserve chaplain, so in the civilian world, I'm a uh, parish pastor. I'm a husband, a father. I have two kids. Uh, they're 14 and 12. Mm. Um, my son is about here. <laughs> I think when I get back, he's going to be about there. Uh -huh. uh, 14 years old. He's almost six, two and a half. Uh, so he's growing very quickly. Uh, my daughter is 12. Um, she's not growing quite as quickly, but she's pretty tall herself. So I'm a, I'm a chaplain, I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, a father, but you pick the order. Right now, I guess chaplain comes first because I'm here. Um, but, you know, we all have many roles that we play in our lives. I'm an ELCA Lutheran, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It's the largest Lutheran body in the, in, in the United States. Uh, that's my endorsing agent. That's where I was born. I was born into a small-ish country church uh, in a small town in south-central Pennsylvania. I grew up there. I was born there. I was baptized in Lutheran faith. As a Lutheran, I get to claim the oldest Protestant denomination. Maybe, maybe you knew that already. <laughs> we all came from mm -hmm. Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Uh -huh. Even though he didn't want to start all this, he didn't want anybody called Lutherans. And actually, they used Lutheran as a, as a, as a derogatory term to make fun of them, uh, those Lutherans that were breaking from the Catholic Church. But besides being born a Lutheran, I've grown to love the theology that I've lived as a child, now as an adult, now as a pastor and a chaplain. A theology that emphasizes God's action in our lives, that emphasizes God's grace, the faith that we have in God, through Jesus Christ, through the Word of God. The grace that comes to us in the sacraments, baptism, communion, for my tradition. But also the theology that that gives me tolerance. And I use that in the best possible way. Not tolerance like you tolerate someone, but acceptance. Acceptance that we all come to God in different ways. And my Lutheran theology lets me welcome that difference. How you come to God as a faithful Christian is what matters. How I come to God as a faithful Christian who happens to be Lutheran, is what matters. And because of that, it means I, I can be nothing but joyful to be here with you, because I know and I trust that we actually have much more in common than we have different. And we come together in this place to worship together, to hear the word of God, to offer praise, to hear what God is asking of us today. But now there's something else I have to tell you about Lutherans. I need, a, I need a prop for this. This is how Lutherans worship. <laughs> like this. Uh -huh. Like this. And maybe if it's a traditional Lutheran church, a little bit of this. Mm -hmm. Now I'm generalizing, really. Mm -hmm. Not all Lutherans worship like that. There are Lutherans that worship much like we worship tonight. I come from both. I grew up in that small country church where we never, we never even knelt. We sit or we stood. The congregation I serve now has two worship services, actually three. But we have a traditional worship service. We also have a contemporary worship service. But mostly Lutherans are a little bit scared to be too excited in worship. <laughs> if you are a Lutheran, you can clap like this. Usually you try to get on the right beat, which doesn't always happen. Your arms, they don't go very high. <laughs> Just don't. But like I said, Amen. we have more in common than we have different. The other thing about a Lutheran worship service is the only time a Lutheran says amen in the middle of a sermon is if the preacher went way too long and they're really just tired of it. <laughs> Again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just told the so I'm gonna I'm generalizing. Not all Lutherans worship the same way. But we remember what we have in common God's grace, God's faith through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But all this about Lutherans and me isn't just introduction for tonight. It's also because I want to make a point about perspective. Because we all come together to hear the word of God with a particular perspective that we can't 
ignore, or avoid, or get away from. We all come from different places, different places around the country, perhaps different places around the world. And so we come together to hear the word of God, to let God's word speak to us. But sometimes we come to hear something specific, something that we bring to that hearing of the word. Something we want to hear. There's nothing wrong with having a unique perspective. There's nothing wrong with expecting the word to do something we need. To answer a question we might have. But we have to know that God might act in a way we don't expect. God might do something else. <laughs> Mighty God. God's word will do what God wants it to do. Amen. Despite us. Regardless of what we might want. In spite of what we bring with us. And so as we hear the word of God tonight. And some of you are probably wondering if you've ever actually read the word of God. But I will in a moment. As we hear the word of God. I want you to open your heart and your mind to what God might be doing. <clears throat> open yourself to allow God's work to work in your life. And so let's pray before we read God's word. Gracious and good God, as we come before you tonight, we ask for you to open our hearts and minds to your word to the ways that you will work in our lives, the ways that you want us to hear your word of hope, your word of promise, your word of love. Come to us now, God, in this time of power, of prayer, of listening. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read from the 35th chapter of Isaiah. If you have the NIV Bible from the, from the uh, shelf, it's on page 496. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Now as I read this tonight, it comes from my tradition, the Lutheran tradition where we follow a set, normally, again, generalizing a little bit, we follow a set of readings that lead us through the church year. And this is the reading for the third Sunday of Advent from the book of Isaiah. In Advent, when we're living into the expectation of Christmas, when we're living with that expectation that God is coming, this intentional journey of Advent, the journey of expectation, waiting for Emmanuel, we turn often to this book of Isaiah, to the prophecies that were written there to the people of Israel. This people that had endured great trial. The people that were enduring oppression and exile. This people who felt a profound absence of God and God's love. Their perspective was one of loss and abandonment. They had been overcome by the Babylonians. Their temple was destroyed. Their people were scattered and enslaved. And they needed God to come to their rescue to deliver them, to return them to a place of love, to return them home. Now on a deployment like this, we just might understand that feeling a little bit. I've been here exactly 10 days. Anybody been here longer than that? Amen. Amen. Some of you, as we heard tonight, are very close to that return home. Is anybody else missing their family at this point? Their home? their loved ones. Now, we aren't in exile against our will like the Israelites. We're not beyond hope. We're not suffering violent oppression in this place like they were. But being here isn't easy. Mm 